This will be uh, Think or Be Eaten, number five. Um, the 1934 coup, boo. And more about that just in a minute. <clears throat> a couple of things real quick. Is in a sense, they have something to do with this topic of um, the 1934 coup to unseat the sitting president, FDR. But um, it is what? I think it's what, June 2nd? I believe that's the day I'm doing this. Yeah, June 2nd, what happened to the swine flu? And what happened to North Korea? <clears throat> and I bring that up because in Iran, there's a little Iran thing going on, but not much. So what do they have us worried about uh, today? I don't know. Um, but there's something, I guess, I, I missed um, maybe hurricanes and you know, freaking everybody about that and how it's got to do with global warming, which it does not. And William Gray gave a very, a very uh, dynamic presentation uh, a year ago that my boss's, uh, my wife's boss attended, in which we um, listened to on the stream and also played some of it back. He explained it all, but you know, he said, you know, the trouble with these people, meaning Gore and those types, because they don't want to deal with science, <clears throat> right? So anyway. Uh, the reason I bring that up is because newspapers, and this is uh, going to be addressed in one of the two books I'm going to use uh, to uh, break down this 1934 coup and its principles, the most colorful of which, of whom, would be Smedley Butler. But by this time already, and I, I think I read part of this as well before from the congressional record, where the newspapers were already tied up at this time. So they were at the behest of the handlers. And in this case, uh, Sutton comes down quite hard, and I believe Hans Schmidt does also, uh, on the New York Times and some other papers of Philadelphia Inquirer uh, for, not, for dropping complete coverage of the uh, hearings about the coup. And so we see that today also in all media. Back then they had to deal with the newspapers, and by the 30s obviously they had radio, and you know that fell under uh, the uh, aegis of the robber barons, most notably Rockefeller and Morgan. Uh, so uh, that's what we're looking at. Also, at that time, there might have been a certain, um, I don't want to say mm, sympathy for, perhaps interest in the fascist movement in Europe. I guess most notably at that time would be Germany, Italy, and France in, in that order. Uh, I don't know that Americans thought it that um, evil. Part of the fascist, pro-fascist faction in the United States at that time may have been uh, because a, a certain segment of the population, and I would assume a large one, uh, was pro-German, not necessarily pro-Hitler, uh, but pro-German and anti-Brit. I think that goes back even to the founding of this country. Uh, so uh, there might have been a little bit more of an openness to uh, not necessarily embrace fascism, but see it as a necessary neutralizer or antidote to communism. But to me, it's still both sides of the same coin. It's another Hegelian dialectic. And that brings me to this also. Um, given 1934 and the coup and a certain element that was pro-German and it's by extension a certain percentage of that and it may have been large, I don't know, was anti-Jewish. And they also equated uh, Jews with communism. Now, I, I would ask you if you get a chance to go read John Carlson's book, um, Undercover, which you can read online. And if, if you can either put that in a search engine and find it, because it's, it's on a Spitfire site, forget what Dave Emery says about it, just get past his bullshit, and go on to reading it for yourself, okay? I'm glad it's up there, it's a good service. And all, it, or also, you can go to um, thinkofbeeaten.com, hit the, um, uh, the uh, link for the uh, Inside the Grassy Knoll Ezine, and you... Um, uh, can click on my uh, recommended readings, and it's in there. But Carlson talks about this, about this fascist, pro-fascist sentiment 
Ah, that's the best word, in the United States. And it, it may factor into what we're going to read here. And I will tell you that the two books are Wall Street and FDR by Antony, Antony C. Sutton, and also Maverick Marine, which is about Butler by Hans Schmidt. And it devotes a, a certain amount of pages, uh, a considerable amount of pages to the coup and Butler's involvement. And also, so it gives you two sources. Most people, I think, are just aware of whatever's been excerpted from Jules Archer. I don't know how many people have read Archer's book. But, and other people chiming in on this. And I know Emory's got interviews up there. I don't know who they're from. I didn't want to hear them. I'm just doing what I found. I'm not devaluing what's out there, but I did what I had to do free of anybody else's in, um, influence. Because something isn't right about this. Something's very not right about this. And the reason I say it is because you had no indictments, even though some witnesses uh, perjured themselves before the uh, committee they had um, for un-American activities. But here's the other thing, too, and that is if you're trying to Let's face it, overthrow a sitting president, that's treason. I mean, that's punishable by execution. But FDR, the, the target, the supposed victim, d didn't bat an eye. So, hmm, why? Why, you know, FDR not putting his fist down and saying, whoa, what, what are you letting this guy get away for? What about the suppressed testimony that nobody's hearing about? I don't know. And I'm, I'm open to ideas, and after I get through this, and I can only tell you this. In my heart, I believe it was a stage show to gain sympathy, support for FDR for what was clearly socialist moves. There's no two ways about it. We're seeing it today. This is a carbon copy, okay, with certain differences, generally speaking, we are being Sovietized and socialized, probably, in, when this is all over and done with, in as great a manner as what took place under FDR, which was not his idea. And I'll say why in a minute. But if it's not as big as that one, it's going to be the final. And I, was, I, had, I don't listen to my archives but I did have to hit a few to find out how to title some of them. They're up there now for June. This is volume two. And I, I had a laugh because in one of them, where it was just one of the acts between Harry and myself, in November of 2002, right around Thanksgiving, a little bit before and after, when we talked about some of these subjects, I, I said back then that there is going to be a repeat of a sort of Weimar Republic to the National Socialists here, um, with and also with the same kind of things that were happening on FDR with WPA projects and CCCs and all this. And I was saying that back then. I mean, I, I didn't even know I was doing that. I don't know what that means, but it seemed clear to me. And the reason why I say that FDR was not the one to come up with all these uh, social programs, because in a 1932 book by William Z. Foster, who was second in command of the American Communist Party, wrote at that time in Toward Soviet America, also readable online, and that's in my recommended reading. If you want to go there, that's easiest for you to hit. And he said, you know, this is what's going to happen in the United States. He knew, in, well, obviously before 32, and this is before 34, 33, 34 is when uh, the heavy programs started to get uh, implemented, the social programs, that this was going to happen. So how did Foster know? And he was the second in command soon to replace Earl uh, Browder, who they kicked to the curb. And you can read about that in um, Bella Dodd's School of Darkness, also there to be read online. There's a lot of good stuff out there. And again, I have that link somewhere. I checked those links before we went up with the uh, Inside the Grassy Knoll, and they were all good. And they do sometimes disappear. Sometimes they go somewhere else. But boy, I tell you. So anyway, not to go too far afield, the American communists knew this was going to happen. And who else? Who, who knows who else didn't know? You know, probably John Dewey knew. And a lot of pro-communist, pro-leftist type people, that this was going to happen. They knew that this wasn't FDR's idea. This is the plan he got. And the robber barons were behind that. That's why in the 50s you had the two committees with, with whatever patriotic Americans were left in Congress to take a look at what was going on with the tax-exempt foundations. 
the Cox and the Reese committees both were trashed. Uh, Wayne Hayes, that idiot who got caught with a bimbo in the Washington, was it the Jefferson Basin or whatever? <laughs> idiot. Well, he got what he deserved. But anyway, uh, he was placed on at least one of those committees. He might have been on both, but uh, to make sure that he uh, could obstruct them as best he could, and he did. Now, you know, if you go to Wikipedia and read about the Cox or the Reese committees, they're like, well, you know, nothing was ever brought up. Look, Wikipedia is as bought out and as controlled as your other cyclopedias and history texts. I go to Wikipedia to find dates, and that's about it. So they look at these two committees like they didn't know what they were doing, basically. I know that's an overstatement and an overgeneralization, I should say. But, you know, forget it. Renee Worms's book, which is not online, uh, Foundations, Their Power and Influence, does a great job, I think, in explaining what was going on at that time. It was also on the... Uh, the heels of the McCarthy debacle, which is also interesting for a lot of reasons. So anyway, uh, that's that's what's so crazy about this 34 coup. It never got close to, to happening. People flashed around money, talked it up, names were dropped, but they didn't amass any army. And you can imagine how hard that would be. So anyway, but I've said that. Now, here's where I'm going. Whatever I'm going to read from the two books, I've not excised anything that didn't fit with my the way I felt about it. I didn't. And you can check it out for yourself. I'll tell you that Maverick Marine is uh, is not online in totality, but it's there. And you can find that. It's through a Google uh, website or through Google search. And you can you can check it against what, I, what I've read. Um, but like I said, there are some uh, pages that are excised. I guess they have to do that because they don't put the complete book up, and maybe that saves them from some kind of copyright infringement. I don't know. But it's not in, total, in totality on the Google site. So, I, I mean, I, I'm i reading what I feel is pertinent, almost everything that is pertinent to it. Um, FDR was Wall Street. Who were we kidding? That Wall Street was going to unseat FDR makes no sense. And if it was a hedge against communism, that fascism, fascism was going to be brought in, the Wall Street bankers backed both sides. And you can read about this, too, in Sutton's... Um, Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, Wall Street and the rise of Hitler, those are online. Um, and The Best Enemy Money Can Buy, those three books are online. You can see them. You can hit them on inside uh, the knoll as well. There are links to that. If not, go to reformed-theology.org and click, click on the left on SRT Books. So I'm doing this from memory, but I feel it's, it's pretty accurate. And you can read them. So, I, you know, what we're looking at, I think, are two made-up oppositions, and so what would the benefit have been? There had to be a benefit, no doubt about it. Was it a shot across FDR's bow saying, if you don't do this stuff, I don't know. But clearly, nothing of substance was approached. And again, no indictments for treason, amazing. No, no uh, squeak or squeal or holler from FDR about this? Like, how, you know, how come we're letting the perps go? No. But I will tell you this, and what's interesting is that uh, when Ro Roosevelt was originally elected in uh, 1932, he uh, kicked the crap out of Hoover. And then when he goes back for re-election in 36, really still not out of the Depression, climbing out a little bit, and there would be another hiccup called the 37 recession. And it's, it's admitted that the only thing that got the United States out of the Depression was obviously tooling up for World War II. But anyway, in 36, after his first term, clearly this guy's got to be the favorite because he kicks the crap out of Landon. Al Landon. I mean, that was the worst beating he gave any um, presidents, or uh, opponents, rather, for the uh, presidency. And um, Wilkie gave him the closest run, and then Dewey. And, um, and then, of course, there's the famous Dewey-Truman election. That's another whole story. But anyway, so the country could not have been necessarily um, upset and may have even galvanized um, to Roosevelt uh, because of the incident. I don't know. But, I mean, he just turns around and just whips the crap out of Landon. And, of course, uh, the rest is history. He does, he does win four elections. All right, so... We're going to get into the nuts and bolts of this. And one last thing about this fascist movement. And again, Carlson's undercover is pretty good. Uh, you could Because he looks at them as like super patriots. That can be a problem. And I think you see the same thing today. 
And that's why when I said, you know, something, I'm not going to dwell on this, but there's something, there's a reason why Jones exponentially expanded his base. Not so much his support of listeners, which might have happened, I don't know. But all of a sudden, you know, this one-man show or the two-person show with with um, himself and uh, his wife, all of a sudden just sprang out. And I'm wondering, how can one person do this? You know, but anyway, I think there's a reason. And obviously, sometime before or right up to when uh, he started to uh, stump for Paul, because he's bringing everybody back into believing the government is sound, that we can have a good... He's bringing you back into the matrix. And there were, at that time in the United States, super patriots, slightly with a brown shirt mentality, that thankfully got kiboshed. What I'm accusing Jones of doing is raising up perhaps for something from now for another six to seven years when there'll be a World War III, a group of super patriots or, you know, that's the best you know, they're basically know-nothings. They're cement heads. Because I have to laugh. I, uh, I ping back through refers to my server, which of course uh, can, really, I mean, people I know have been poking in around visigot.com. I don't care. I never took the infrastructure down, but I did take the audio off. Um, so uh, people are still going there as of June 1st, yesterday. But I ping back to see where some uh, people hit me from. And one of them was a Prison Planet Forum. Well, I couldn't get into anything else there. I got in to find out that there was there, and I looked at some of the... Uh, the discussion room uh, headings. One of them was uh, enemies of the Constitution. You know, like report and identify them. And I'm laughing. I'm going, oh my God. I mean, can you see where I'm going with this? Enemies of the Constitution. Uh, so we don't agree with the intent of the Constitution. We're what? Fifth columnists? What assholes. But this is what's being raised up. And if you ever read any of the things that some of his followers write, I mean, they misspell one-syllable words. And I don't mean, you know, words that are where we get involved with um, homonyms. I mean, they cannot spell one-syllable words. I mean, so anyway, that's what I see happening now. I said it before and I'm saying it now. And there's a certain melding, like I said, of certain sectors. But what it comes down to is people who believe in the Constitution, uh, you know, think that we can vote in good government, and I wish it were so, and you know I wish it were so. I have no joy in saying this, but I knew something wasn't right, and I was at least intellectually, uh, not astute, but I mean, had the integrity to say, look, let me check this out. And the reason why the, <laughs> people don't have rights when they really get push uh, the middle to the pe pedal to the middle is that, you know, I wish we did, but we don't. And anybody who's voted as long as I have or voted half as long as I have and took st stood back and said, you know what, what's really gotten better? I don't care my party's in, your party's in. There's something not right here. That's all. Just be honest with yourself. And these people aren't because they can't. We've been through all that. They're scared. They are a herd mentality. And he's finding them. And I, if he ever got back for a certain reason, I'm assuming that, that might be it. Just like movements in the 40s and the 30s about which Carlson writes. And that's it. Now let's get into the good stuff. Um, with uh, Anthony C. Sutton's Wall Street and FDR, which is not online, and Hans Schmidt's Maverick Marine, part of which is online. All right, I'm going to first read from Sutton's Wall Street and FDR. A little bit about the lineage of FDR. And, of course, he comes from two families, Roosevelt, obviously, and Delano, uh, well, obviously. Or maybe not so obviously, but those are the two families. Okay. The Delano family uh, proudly traces its ancestors back to the Acti, a 600 B.C. Roman family. They are equally proud of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Indeed, the Delanos claim that the Delano influence was the predominant factor in FDR's life work and accounts for his extraordinary achievements. Be that as it may, there is no question that the Delano side of the family links FDR to many other rulers and other politicians. According to the Delano family history, and this is a quote, Franklin shared common ancestry with one-third of his prede predecessors in the White House. <laughs> Incestuous, isn't it? All right, that was the end of the quote. The presidents linked to FDR on the Delano side are John Adams, James Madison, John Quincy Adams, 
William Henry Harrison, Zachary Taylor, Andrew Johnson, Ulysses S. Grant, Benjamin Harrison, and William Howard Taft. On the Roosevelt side of the family, FDR was related to Theodore Roosevelt and Martin Van Buren, who married Mary Aspinwall Roosevelt. The wife of George Washington, Martha Dandridge, was among FDR's ancestors. And it is claimed by Daniel Delano that Winston Churchill and F. Franklin D. Roosevelt, our boy, were eighth cousins once removed. This almost makes the United States a nation ruled by a royal family, a mini-monarchy. The reader must make his own judgment on Delano's gene genealogical claims. This author, author lacks the ability to analyze the confused and complex family relationships involved. More to the point, and without question, the Delanos were active in Wall Street in the 1920s and 30s and long before. The Delanos were prominent in railroad development in the United States and abroad. Lyman Delano, 1883 to 1944, was a prominent railroad executive and maternal grandfather of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Like FDR, Lyman began his career in the insurance business with the Northwestern Life Insurance of Chicago followed by two years with Stone and Webster. For most of his business life, Lyman Delano served on the board of the Atlanta Coast Line Railroad as president in 1920 and as chairman of the board from 1931 to 1940. Other important affiliations of Lyman Delano were director, in parentheses, along with W. Avril Harriman, in parentheses, of the Aviation Corporation, Pan American Airways, P&O Steamship Lines, sounds like a monopoly uh, square, and, a, and half a dozen railroad companies. Another Wall Street uh, Delano was Moreau Delano, a partner in Brown Brothers and Company. Hmm. In parentheses, after 1933, it absorbed Harriman and Company to become Brown Brothers Harriman, in parentheses, and a director of Cuban Cane Products Company and the American Banknote Company. The really notable Delano on, on Wall Street was FDR's favorite uncle, this according to Elliot Roosevelt. Frederick Adrian Delano, 1863 to 1953, who started his career with the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad and later assumed the presidency of the Wheeling and Lake Erie Railroad, the Wabash Railroad, and in 1913, the Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville Railway. Uncle Fred, in parentheses, I'm sorry, in quotation marks, was consulted in 1921 at a critical point in FDR's infantile, uh, infantile paralysis attack, quickly found Dr. Samuel A. Levine for an urgently needed diagnosis and arranged for the special private train to transport FDR from Maine to New York as he began the long and arduous road to recovery. In 1914, Woodrow Wilson appointed Uncle Fred to be a member of the Federal Reserve Board. Intimate Delano connections with the international banking fraternity are exemplified by a confidential letter from central banker Benjamin Strong to Fred Delano requesting confidential FRB data. That would be Federal Reserve Board. Here it goes. My dear Fred, would it be possible for you to send me in strict confidence the figures obtained by the comptroller as to holdings of foreign securities by national banks? I would be a good deal influenced in my opinion in regard uh, uh, the present situation, if I could get hold of these figures, which would be treated with such confidence as you suggest. If the time ever comes when you are able to slip away for a week or so for a bit of a change and rest, why not take a look at Denver and, incidentally, pay me a visit? There are a thousand things I would like to talk over with you. Faithfully yours, Benjamin Strong. Um, <clears throat> and this was dated December 11, 1916. Following World War I, Frederick Delano devoted himself to what is euphemistically known as public service while continuing his business operations. Um, right, okay. In 1925, Delano was chairman of the League of Nations International Committee on Opium Production. Yeehaw. In 1927, he was chairman of the Commission on Regional Planning in New York. He then became an active uh, in sponsoring the National Park Commission. In 1934, FDR named Uncle Fred Delano as chairman of the National Resources Planning Board, the International Committee of the National Resources Planning Board, which presumably uh, Frederick, Frederick Delano had some hand in choosing, was a happy little coterie of socialist planners, including um, Lachlan Curry, Leon Henderson, Isidore Lublin, in parentheses, prominent in the transfer of industrial technology to the USSR in the pre-Korean War era, 
in a parenthesis, and Mordecai Ezekiel. The advisor to the board was Beardsley Rummel. Then from 1931 to 1936, while involved in socialist planning schemes, Delano was also chairman of the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, Virginia. In brief, Frederick Delano was simultaneous both capitalist and planner. Delano left a few writings from which we can glean some concept of his political ideas. There we find support for the thesis that the greatest proponents of government regulation are the businessmen who are to be regulated, although Delano does warn that government ownership of railroads can be carried too far. And here is a block quote. Government ownership of railroads is a bugaboo, uh, which though often referred to, the public does not demand. If government ownership of railway comes, it will come because the owners of railways prefer it to government regulation, and it will be a sorry day for the republic when regulation is carried to such an extreme that the owners of the railways are unwilling to accept any longer the responsibilities of management. However, in another book, written about 20 years later, Delano is much more receptive to government planning. Block quote. A big problem in planning is that of educating the people. If the people only realize that there can be social gains from directed effort, and that the time to accomplish most by planning comes before the need of making changes are manifested, the other problems of planning could be more easily solved. Further, another block quote. The above brief classification of the problem involved in planning serves as a basis for indi in indicating the need for both direct and indirect social control. Very few people really know the best use of land for their own advantage, to say nothing of planning its use for the common good. Don't be so good to me. Uh, institutions have done a great deal in educating farmers how to plant individual farms, and yet many of the farms in this country are poorly organized. In brief, the Delano side of the family has undertaken capitalist enterprises and has Wall Street interests going well back into the 19th century. By the 1930s, however, Frederick Delano had abandoned capitalist initiative for socialist planning. And that's the one segment where the Delano's um, a connection with Wall Street and um, I'm only going to add real succinctly that this is what makes me believe, once again, that all roads lead to collectivism, eventually to global communism, uh, <laughs> capitalism without competition, the state in control of everything. And this is what we see here. I mean, they go from being entrepreneurs and businessmen, private, and then they want to go into government planning, which is why I think we've always had a planned economy. And certainly since 1973, and that's a story for another time. So there you have the Delano side of FDR's family and its connections to Wall Street. Also, uh, before we move on to Roosevelt, the Roosevelt family and Wall Street, let me give you some of the books that Sutton is basing his on. Now, if you get the book yourself, obviously you'll have that. All right, uh, some of the books that deal with this particular um, Subject, The Delanos in Wall Street, uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the Delano Influence by De Daniel W. Delano, Jr. You have to take that with a certain grain of something. Um, Sutton's Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution. An Untold Story, The Roosevelts of Hyde Park by Elliot Roosevelt and James Bro. And then as the United States Senate... Um, Hearings before the Special Committee Investigating the Munitions Industry, 74th Congress, Second Session, Part 25, uh, let's see, World War Financing and United States Industrial Expansion, 1914-1915, J.P. Morgan and Company. Also, uh, Franklin, uh, Frederick A. Delano's, let me see if that's his. Yes, I believe it is. Are our railroads fairly treated? It's an address before the Economic Club of New York, April 29th, 1913. Also, Frederick A. Delano, what about the year 2000? Joint Committee on Basis of Sound Land Policy, pages 138 to 139. And that's the last site for the Delano family in Wall Street. Those are books you can also consult. All right, here we go with... The Roosevelt family in Wall Street. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was also descended uh, on the Roosevelt side from one of the oldest banking families in the United States. FDR's great-grandfather, James Roosevelt, founded the Bank of New York in 1784 and was its president from 1786 to 1791. 
The investment banking firm of Roosevelt and Son of New York City was founded in 1797, and in the 30s, George E. Roosevelt, FDR's cousin, was the fifth member of the family in direct succession to uh, head the firm. So the New York City banking roots of the Roosevelt family extend without interruption back into the late 18th century. In the industrial sphere, James Roosevelt built the first American sugar refinery in New York City in the 1740s, and Roosevelt still had connections with Cuban sugar refining in the 1930s. FDR's father, also named James Roosevelt, was born at Hyde Park, New York in 1828 into this old and distinguished family. This James Roosevelt graduated from Harvard Law School in 1851, became a director of the Consolidated Coal Company of Maryland, and, like the Delanos in subsequent years, uh, was associated with the development of transportation, first as general manager of the Cumberland and Pennsylvania Railroad, and then as president of the Louisville, New Albany, and Chicago Railroad, the Susquehanna Railroad Company, Champlain Transportation Company, Lake George Steamboat Company, and New York and Canada Railroad Company. James Roosevelt was also vice president and manager of the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company and chairman of the Maritime Canal Company of Nicaragua, but most significantly, most significantly was an organizer of the Southern Railway Security Company established in 1871 and one of the first of the security holding companies formed to buy up and consolidate railroads. The Southern Railway Security Company was a consolidation or cartelization scheme similar in its monopolistic principles to the trade associations formed by Franklin D. Roosevelt in the 1920s and to the National Recovery Act, another cartelization scheme of the New Deal. James Roosevelt's second wife was Sarah, daughter of Warren Delano, and their son was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, later President of the United States. Franklin was educated at Groton and Harvard, then went on to Columbia Law School. According to his son Elliot, FDR, quote, never graduated or took a degree, but he was able to pass his New York State Bar examination, end of quote. FDR's first job was with the old established downtown law firm of Carter, Ledyard, and Milburn, whose principal client was J. Pierpont Morgan. And in three years, FDR worked his way up from minor legal research posts to the firm's municipal court and admiralty divisions. <laughs> Where have I heard Admiralty? Uh, we should note in passing that when FDR first went to Washington, D.C. in 1916 to become Assistant Secretary of the Navy, it was Thomas W. Lamont, international banker and most influential of the Morgan Partners, who leased the FDR home in New York. I'm going to assume that Lamont is the same Lamont family that I, that, um, I guess donated the money for the um, Lamont like Geological Institute, I believe it is, uh, where those of you who know about 9-11 and, and the spikes in the seismograph, it was that Lamont uh, Institute uh, where they were recorded. Uh, it is a place I pass by many times without giving much thought. Uh, it is just across the New Jersey uh, border in New York in what is Rockland County and very near the Palisades, in fact, right on it. There were other Roosevelts on Wall Street. George Emlyn Roosevelt, 1887 to 1963, was a cousin of both Franklin and Theodore Roosevelt. In 1908, George Emlyn became a member of the family banking firm Roosevelt and Son. In January 1934, after passage of FDR's Banking Act of 1933, the firm was split into three individual units, Roosevelt and Son, with which George Roosevelt remained as a senior partner, Dick and Merle Smith, and Roosevelt and Weigold. George Emlyn Roosevelt was a leading ra railroad financier, involved in no fewer than 14 railroad reorganizations, as well as directorships in several important companies, including the Morgan Controlled Guarantee Trust Company, the Chemical Bank, and the Bank for Savings in New York. The full list of George Emlyn's directorships at 1930 requires six inches of small print in Poor's Directory of Directors. Another Morgan-associated Roosevelt was Theodore Roosevelt, 26th President of the United States and the grandson of Cornelius Roosevelt, one of the founders of the Chemical National Bank. Like Clinton Roosevelt, whom we shall discuss later, Theodore served as a New York State Assemblyman from 1882 to 1884. He was appointed a member of the U.S. Civil Service Commission in 1889, Police Commissioner of New York City in 1895, and Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1897, and was elected vice president in 1900 to become president of the United States upon the assassination of President McKinley in 1901. 
Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt was re-elected president in 1904 to become founder of the Progressive Party, backed by J.P. Morgan money and influence, and so launched the United States on the road to the welfare state. The longest section of the platform of the Progressive Party was that devoted to, quote, business, unquote, and reads in part. This is a block quote. We therefore demand a strong national regulation of interstate co corporations. The corporation is an essential part of modern business. The concentration of modern business, in some degree, is both inevitable and necessary for national and international business efficiency. The only real significant difference between this statement backed by Morgan Money and the Marxian analysis is that Karl Marx thought of concentration of big business as inevitable rather than necessary. Yet Roosevelt's Progressive Party plugging for business regulation was financed by Wall Street, including the Morgan Control International Harvester Corporation and J.P. Morgan Partners. In Kolko's words, this is a block quote, and this is from Gabriel Kolko, The Triumph of Con uh, Conservatism. Um, let's see. Okay, 1963. Uh, and it's from page 202. So this is Gabriel Kolko. In his words, and it's a block quote, the party's financial records for 1912 list C.K. McCormick, Mr. and Mrs. Medill McCormick, Mrs. Catherine McCormick, Mrs. A.A. A. McCormick, Fred S. Oliver, and James H. Pierce. The largest donations of the progressives, however, came from the Muncie's, Perkins, the Willard Straits of the Morgan Corp, uh, Company, Douglas Robinson, W.E. Roosevelt, and Thomas Plant. Moving on, there is, of course, a long Roosevelt political uh, tradition centered on the state of New York and the federal government in Washington that parallels this Wall Street tradition. Nicholas Roosevelt, 1658 to 1742, was, in 1700, a member of the New York State Assembly. Isaac Roosevelt, 1726 to 1794, was a member of the New York Provincial uh, Congress. James I. Roosevelt, 1795 to 1875, was a member of the New York State Assembly in 1835 and 1840, and a member of the U.S. House of Representatives between 1841 and 1843. Clinton Roosevelt, 1804 to 1898, the author of an 1841 economic program similarly, uh, remarkably similar to Fra uh, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, was a member of the New York State Assembly in 1835. Robert Barnwell Roosevelt, 1829 to 1906, was a member of the U.S. House of Representatives in 1871 to 73, and U.S. Minister to Holland, 1888 to 1890. Then, of course, as we have noted, there was President Theodore Roosevelt. Franklin continued the Theodore Roosevelt political tradition as a New York State Senator, 1910 to 1913, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, 1930 to 1920, Governor of the State of New York, 1928 to 1930, and then President, 1933 to 1945. While FDR was in office, other Roosevelts assumed minor offices. Theodore Roosevelt, Jr., uh, 1887 to 1944, was a member of the New York State Assembly from 1919 to 1921, then continued the virtual Roosevelt Navy monopoly as the Secretary of the Navy from 1921 to 1924, <laughs> Governor of Puerto Rico from 1922 to 1932, thinking about the IRS and where was it formed, uh, and Governor General of the uh, Philippines from 1932 to 1933. Nicholas Roosevelt was Vice Governor of the Philippines in 1930. Other Roosevelts have continued this political tradition since the New Deal era. An alliance of Wall Street and political office is implicit in this Roosevelt tradition. The policies implemented by the many Roosevelts have tended toward increased state intervention into business, desirable to some business elements, and therefore the Roosevelt search uh, for political office can fairly be viewed as a self-seeking device. The euphemism of public service is a cover for utilizing the police power of the state for personal ends, a thesis we must investigate. If the Roosevelt tradition had been one of the uh, uncompromising laissez-faire one of uncompromising laissez-faire of getting the state out of business rather than encouraging intervention into economic activities, then our assessment would necessarily be quite different. However, from at least Clinton Roosevelt in 1841 to FDR, the political power accumulated by the Roosevelt clan has been used on the side of regulating business in the interests of restricting competition, encouraging monopoly, and so bleeding the consumer in the interests of a financial elite. Further, we must consider the observation conveyed by Franklin D. Roosevelt to Edward House, Mandel House, remember that, right? 
and cited in the epigraph to this chapter that, quote, a financial element in the large centers has owned the government ever since the days of Andrew Jackson, end of quote. Consequently, it is pertinent to conclude this introductory chapter with the 1943 observations of William Allen White, an honest ed editor, if there ever was one, who made one of the best literary critiques on this financial establishment in the context of World War II. This, it should be noted, was after 10 years of FDR and at the peak of Roosevelt's political power. And here we go. And this can be found in 1,000 Americans by George Seldes. 1947, pages 149 to 150. And again, this is from William Allen White. And this will end this section of FDR's connections with Wall Street on both sides of his family, maternal, paternal. One cannot move about Washington without bumping into the fact that we are running two wars, a foreign war and a domestic one. The domestic war is the various war boards. Every great, every great commodity industry in this country is organized nationally, and many of them, perhaps most of them, are parts of a great national uh, organizations, uh, cartels, agreements, which function on both sides of the battlefront. Here in Washington, every industry is interested in saving its own self. It wants to come out of the war with a whole hide and with its organization unimpaired, legally or illegally. One is surprised to find men representing great commodity trusts or agreements or syndicates planted in the various war bonds, uh, war boards, I'm sorry. It is silly to say new dealers run this show. It's run largely by absentee owners of amalgamated industrial wealth, men who either directly or through their employers control small minority blocks, closely organized, that manipulate the physical plants of these trusts. For the most part, these managerial magnates are decent patriotic Americans. Hmm. They have great talents. If you touch them in nine relations of life out of ten, they are like or they are kindly, courteous Christian gentlemen. Hmm. But in the tenth relation where it touches their own organization, they are stark mad, ruthless, unchecked by God or man, paranoiacs, in fact, as evil in their design as Hitler. Whoa. They are determined to come out of this war victorious for their own stockholders, which is not surprising. It is understandable also for Hitler to desire to come out of this war at any cost victorious for the German people. But this attitude of the men who control the great commodity in industries and who propose to run them according to their own judgment and their own morals do not make a pretty picture for the welfare of the common man. Those international combinations of industrial capital are fierce troglodyte animals with tremendous power and no social brains. They hover like an old Silurian reptile about our decent, more or less, Christian civilization, like great dragons in this modern day when dragons are supposed to be dead. Whoa! Wow. All right. That ends that section. Uh, books for you. Uh, we mentioned uh, our, our railroads. Uh, we already did that. All right. Um, yeah, okay. Once again, the untold story by um, Elliot Roosevelt. Uh, Bolshevik Revolution by Sutton, Wall Street and. And that does it for the sites. The rest I gave to you during that. I'll end this um, <clears throat> first part with the last of the setup about the relationship between Wall Street and FDR, which then makes no sense that Wall Street would want to unseat Roosevelt after being his boys. It said in this one place, um, seven, and this is from Sutton's book, 78% of the pre-convention early bird contributions for FDR's 1932 pres presidential bid came from Wall Street. Over three quarters of the money he got came from Wall Street. D did he do something to betray them? But presidents don't, otherwise they get assassinated. It, they, they run with the, with, the, with the ball. They do what they're told. Anyway, it's for everybody to decide, but just this is the last part about a setup with the relationship that Wall Street had with Roosevelt. Uh, and this is from Chapter 11 of Sutton's book, The Corporate Socialists at 120 Broadway, New York City. Uh, there's an epigraph. Already FDR had begun to reappear at the office of the Fidelity and Deposit Company at 120 Broadway. He did not yet visit his law office at 50, uh, 52 Wall Street because of the high front steps. He could not bear the thought of being carried up them in public. 
At 120 Broadway, he could manage, by himself, the one little step up from the sidewalk. This is from Frank Friedel's FDR, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, The Ordeal, uh, 1954. All right, with, going on with Sutton. As in Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, we find many of the leading characters, including FDR um, and firms, even a few of the events described in this book, located at a single address, the Equitable Office Building at 120 Broadway, New York City, which is downtown, ostensibly Wall Street. Franklin D. Roosevelt's or Wall Street District, okay? Franklin D. Roosevelt's office in the early 1920s when he was vice president of the Fidelity and Deposit Company was at 120 Broadway. Biographer Frank Friedel records above his reentry um, to the building after his crippling polio attack. Um, at that time, Bernard Baruch's office was also at 120 Broadway, and Hugh Johnson, later to be the administrator of the NRA, was Bernard Baruch's research assistant uh, at the same address. The executive offices of General Electric and the offices of Gerard Swope, author of the Swope plan that became Roosevelt's NRA, were also there. The Bankers Club was on the top floor of the same equitable office building and was the location of a 1926 meeting by the Butler Affair Plotters. I'll get right back to that. Obviously, there was a great, there was a concentration of talent at this particular address deserve, uh, deserving great greater description. Now, did you just hear that? And was the location of a 1926 meeting by the Butler Affair plotters. How in the world could they be plotting with Butler in 26 when Coolidge is president? Now, it's never explained as far as I can see by Sutton. That is an extremely provocative statement. The location of a 1926 meeting by the Butler Affair plotters. Now, maybe they were later to become the Butler Affair plotters, but how in the world in 26 would you be plotting to overthrow Roosevelt? It, you know, it doesn't make any sense because Coolidge was president. You had to have Hoover next and then FDR because Hoover went from 28 to 32. So Coolidge is president. Why, you know, that there's, is, there's a Butler Affair in 1926? Very strange. All right, and it says again, uh, this 120 Broadway... Um, there was a concentration of talent at this particular address deserving greater description. All right, uh, in a sub-chapter, the Bolshevik Revolution on 120 Broadway. In Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, we noted that revolution-related uh, revolution financiers were concentrated at a single address in New York City, the same equitable office building. In 1917, the headquarters of the number two district of the Federal Reserve System, the most important of the Federal Reserve districts, was located at 120 Broadway. Of nine directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, four were physically located at 120 Broadway, and two of these directors were simultaneously on the board of American International Cooperate, uh, Corporation. The American International Corporation had been founded in 1915 by the Morgan Interest with enthusiastic participation by the Rockefeller and Stillman groups. The general offices of AIC were at 120 Broadway. Its directors were heavily interlocked with other major Wall Street financial and industrial interests, and it was determined that American International Corporation had a significant role in the success and consolidation of the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution. AIC Executive Secretary William Franklin Sands um, asked for his opinion of the Bolshevik Revolution. Let me get that right now. Hmm. Oh. Yeah, okay. William Franklin Sands asked for his opinion of the Bolshevik Revolution by the State Department within a few weeks of the outbreak in November 17th, uh, November 1917, and in parentheses, long before even a fraction of Russia came under Soviet control, and in parentheses. Sands expressed strong support for the revolution. Sands' letter is reprinted in Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, a memorandum to Dave uh, Lloyd George, Prime Minister of England, from Morgan Associate Dwight Morrow, also urged support for the Bolshevik revolutionaries and backing for its armies. Just a side note here with uh, Dwight Morrow. Uh, you know, a lot of these characters were in and around the, the, the neighborhoods where I grew up, although a half century to a century beforehand. And Dwight Morrow is the name of a high school, also known as Englewood High School. And um, uh, that's in a, a tonier section of Englewood, up on the hill, as they called it along with good old Lamont family, which was just a couple of miles north. Um, 
A director of the FRB of New York, William Boyce Thompson, donated $1 million to the Bolshevik cause and interviewed with Lloyd George on behalf of the emerging Soviets. In brief, we found an identifiable pattern of pro-Bolshevik activity by influential members of Wall Street concentrated in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the American International Corporation, both at 120 Broadway. By 1933, the bank had moved to Liberty Street. Another subhead, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and 120 Broadway. The names of individual FRB directors changed between 1917 and the 1930s. But it was determined that, although the FRB had moved, four, FBI, four R FRB directors still had offices at this address in the New Deal period, as shown in the following table. And I'll just give their names. It's, it, again, it's in a table. It says, Directors of Federal Reserve Bank of New York in the New Deal period. Names Charles E. Mitchell, Albert H. Wigan, Clarence M. Woolley, Owen D. Young. And persons and firms located also at 120 Broadway were Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Bernard Baruch, Gerard Swope, Owen D. Young, one of the FRB, obvious directors. And on 42 Broadway, a stone's throw away, was Herbert Hoover. Others, American International Corp. You, it really doesn't matter with, with some of these. I mean, some of the ones you're going to know, like General Electric, um, um, Armor and Company, that's O-U-R. I'm wondering if that's the food manufacturer gone the way of nickel candy. Also, a character you're going to hear about later, Grayson M.P. Murphy at 52 Broadway. And um, Jackson Martindale, you'll hear from later. John D. Rockefeller, Jr., Percy A. Rockefeller, and Robert S. Clark. And then there's a map that shows you where they're all at within just a couple of blocks. And down on Wall Street District, the blocks are very short. Um, <clears throat> American International Corporation and 120 Broadway. The American International Corporation was formed in 1915 by a coalition of Morgan, Stillman, and Rockefeller interests. Its general offices were at 120 Broadway from 1915 through the 1920s. The great excitement on Wall Street about formation of AIC brought about a concentration of the most powerful financial elements on its board of directors. In effect, a monopoly organization for overseas development and exploitation. Of nine directors on the board in 1930, five were on the AIC board in 1917 at the time of the Bolshevik Revolution. Matthew C. Brush, President and Chairman of the Executive Committee of AIC and Director of the Empire Trust Company. Pierre S. DuPont, member of the DuPont family and a Director of the Bankers Trust Company. Percy A. Rockefeller of the Rockefeller family and Director of National City Bank. Albert H. Wigan, Director of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the Rockefeller Chase National Bank, and Beekman Winthrop of the Warburgs International Banking Corporation and National City Bank. Several prominent financiers joined the board of AIC during the 1920s, including Frank Ashtole, Halstead G. Freeman of the Chase National Bank, Arthur Lehman of Lehman Brothers and the Manufacturers Trust Company and Lehman College, and John J. Raskov, Vice President of DuPont and Director of General Motors and the Bankers Trust Company. Now, remember also, and I'll, I'll get that, that link up, although you, if, you, if you check around Visigoth.com, you can find it. That uh, magazine article in 1976 that came out with newly released information that showed both DuPont and General Motors helped tool Hitler for World War II. So you got the characters on both sides of fascism and Wall Street. That's why I'm saying I believe it's a Hegelian dialectic, but let me go on. Back to Sutton. Matthew C. Brush, President, Director, and Chairman of the Executive Committee of American International Corporation and President of Allied Machinery, a subsidiary company, was also Director and Member of the Executive Committee of International Acceptance Bank. Uh, director and member of the Executive Committee of Barnstall Corporation, Director of Empire Trust Company, and Equitable Office Corporation, Director of uh, Georgian Manganese Company, and Director and member of Executive Committee of the Executive Committee of the Remington Arms Company, identified by General Butler in the last chapter. We'll get to that later. Matthew C. Brush was indeed in the vanguard of Wall Street. Yeah, because it was Remington Arms that was going to supply, I think it supplied money and was going to uh, supply the arms, supposedly, for this 500,000-man army that was going to uh, lead the coup, which, of course, not one person was ever outfitted. Brush's political comp uh, contributions, unlike those of other AIC directors, were apparently limited to $5,000 to the campa campaign of Herbert Hoover in 1928. Brush was director of International Acceptance Bank, which profited from the inflation of the 1920s, as well as a director of Remington Arms. 
and in parentheses, a suppressed name in the Butler affair, in the parentheses, while serving as president of American International, but appears to have been on the fringes of the occurrences explored in this book. On the other hand, four directors of American International have been identified as substantial financial supporters of Franklin D. Roosevelt, Frank Ashtool, Pierre S. DuPont, Arthur Lehman, and John J. Raskob between 1928 and 1932. The Lehman family and John J. Raskob were, as we have seen, at the very heart of Roosevelt's support. It is significant that AIC, the key vehicle for American participation in the American Revolution, should also be unearthed, even in an incidental form, in a study of the Roosevelt era. Franklin D. Roosevelt and 120 Broadway. We have noted that FDR's preferred office, he had two in the early 20s, was the one at 120 Broadway. FDR's Georgia Warm Springs Foundation Incorporated was formed as a Delaware company in July 1926 with offices at 120 Broadway and remained at that address at least through 1936. Remember that Delaware corporations have certain tax advantages. So you can live anywhere and you can create a company uh, in a Delaware corporation. The 1934 annual report for Georgia Warm Springs Foundation shows that its president was listed as Franklin D. Roosevelt, the White House, Washington, D.C., with the head office of the foundation shown at 120 Broadway. The vice president and assistant secretary was Raymond H. Taylor, with Secretary Treasurer Basil O'Connor both shown at 120 Broadway. Basil O'Connor was a close associate and business partner of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Born in 1892, O'Connor received his law degree from Harvard in 1915 and then joined the New York law firm of Kravath and Henderson for one year, leaving to work with Streeter and Holmes in Boston for three years. In 1919, Basil O'Connor uh, established a law practice in New York under his own name. In 1925, the firm of Roosevelt and O'Connor was created, lasting until FDR's inauguration in 1933. After 1934, O'Connor was senior partner in O'Connor and Farber, and in 1944 succeeded Norman H. Davis as chairman of the American Red Cross. O'Connor was a director of several companies in the 1920s of New England Fuel Oil Corporation, in the 1940s of the American Reserve Insurance Company, and the West Indies Sugar Corporation. From 1928 until his death, he was responsible for administration of the Georgia Warm Springs Foundation. The Roosevelt New Deal was a gold mine to some of FDR's associates, including Basil O'Connor. Globe and Rutgers was an insurance company recapitalized with government funds, and the reorganization proved a rich source of fees for attorneys handling the liquidation and reorganization. Of these <coughs> attorneys, President Roosevelt's former firm of O'Connor and Farber demanded the largest single fee until Jesse Jones of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation cut it down. Here is a letter Jesse Jones wrote to Earl Bailey of J&W Seligman and Company about these fees. October 6, 1934. Dear Dr. Bailey, our board is unwilling to invest in our uh, or lend upon stock in an insurance company if indeed we have the right to do so that contemplates, contemplates paying such lawyers' fees, reorganization, or otherwise as is, as is proposed in the case of Globe and Rutgers, which we understand from the information to be and it rattles off what they get, 200,000, 165,000, 95,000, 50,000, 37, 5, 35, 25, 12, all to uh, uh, firms. <clears throat> it says, um, or a total of $619,500, $619,500. Even the suggested reduction to a total of 426000 would be very much more than what would appear to this corporation to be proper fees to be paid by an insurance company that is being recapitalized with government funds. Uh, under court orders, Mr. O'Connor's firm was paid $100,000 in 1934 and $35,000 more the following year. All right, finally, the conclusions about 120 Broadway. And this will wrap it up, the first part. It is virtually impossible to develop an unshakable conclusion about the significance of 120 Broadway. Explanations can range from conspiracy to coincidence. There is none. Um, so what's the difference? Okay. What can we prove with direct rather than circumstantial evidence? First, we know that U.S. assistance to the Bolshevik Revolution originated in the Wall Street Golden Circle in 1917 and was heavily concentrated at this particular address. Also, just remember, too, that Trotsky was getting prepared for this on the east side of New York, um, down that way, but not in Wall Street in particular. Second, when FDR re-entered uh, the business world in 1921, one of the two FDR offices was at this address. 
as was his law partnership with Basil O'Connor and the Georgia Warm Springs Foundation. Third, Bernard Baruch and his assistant Hugh Johnson, later part of the planning and administration of the National Industrial Recovery Act, were in the same building. NRA, uh, National Recovery Act, um, or administration rather, was a logical sequel to the trade associations of the 1920s, and FDR had a prominent role, along with Herbert Hoover, in the implementation of trade association agreements in the 1920s. Fourth, there was an association between General Electric and the Bolshevik Revolution, at least in building up the, nearly, uh, the early Soviet Union. Executive offices of GE were at this address and were those of Gerard Swope, the president of GE, who authorized the Swope plan. Finally, the bizarre Butler affair had a few links with 120 Broadway. For example, this was DuPont's New York address, although Remington Arms was at Rockefeller headquarters, 25 Broadway. Most of the plotters had other addresses, but still all within the Golden Circle. And when they say plotters, this is the coup we're talking about. Uh, nothing is proven by a common geographical location. While 120 Broadway was a massive building, it was by no means the largest in New York City. But how does one explain the concentration of so many links to so many important historical events at one address? One could argue that birds of a feather flock together. On the other hand, it is more plausible that these Wall Streeters were following the maxim laid down by Frederick Howe and found it more convenient, or perhaps more efficient for their purposes, to be at a single address. The point to hold in mind is that no other such geographical concentration exists, and if we ignore the persons and firms at 120 Broadway, there is no case for any relationship between these, these historical events and Wall Street, which incidentally is also an, ex, uh, an excellent reason for retaining one's perspective in accepting the fact that we are discussing a small fraction of the banking community, a, frank, a fraction that has in effect betrayed the financial center of a free economy, and betrayed much more than that. For those of you who are interested, <clears throat> some references that come out of this particular chapter um, about um, the corporate socialists in 120 Broadway would be uh, Sutton's Bolshevik Revolution, his, also his Western technology and Soviet economic development. Uh, others will be, uh, let's see, uh, House of Representatives, investigation of Nazi propaganda activities and investigation of certain other propaganda activities Hearings number 73D, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's not going to help you out too much. Uh, also, the United States Senate, digest of data from the files of a special committee to investigate lobbying activities, 74th Congress, second session, part one. <laughs> that worked out, didn't it, huh? Uh, 1936. And uh, Jesse H. Jones, this is the guy who uh, complained about the fees being paid to uh, uh, law firms. Uh, he, uh, this was found in the book, $50 billion. That's by Jesse H. Jones. And just one other thing. Just if you can think back to when we were reading about the, uh, the two bloodlines of federal, of, of, uh, <laughs> federal D. Roosevelt, that's really accurate, uh, of FDR. You know, in some of these quotes from um, Frederick Delano, about government ownership, but, but what it's, it's, it states here is other, you know, a big problem in planning is that of educating the people. I mean, there's an elitist tone there that also goes along with a collectivist, um, socialist, communist, totalitarian mindset. A big problem in planning is that of educating the people. If the public only realized, blah, 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 and then also... Very few people really know the best use of land for their own advantage. To say nothing of planning its use for the common good. Well, you got it right all there, don't you? As far as uh, collectivism, the best you don't know the best use for your land. To say nothing of planning its use for the common good. And what would that be? Also, lastly, this little other thing from... Um, When does this statement come from? Oh, the platform of the Progressive Party. We therefore demand a strong national regulation of interstate corporations. The corporation is an essential part of modern business. The concentration of modern business in some degree is a both inevitable and necessary for national and international business efficiency, or so they say. Um, this also reminds me, and you might not 
you know, maybe it's my warped brain that, that connects this. But when I think about consolidation, you know, it's always inevitable. And if you think about even the beginning of the United States, when the 13 several states wanted to be as autonomous as possible. Now, you can see there's problems, and that I understand, down the road. But it really didn't matter because the whole idea was to consolidate them, federalize them. And if you want to look at it this way, and I think you can, and Harry and I talked about this a long time ago. He was the one who brought it up, in fact, and I believe he's right, that the federation, the federalization of the United States was, was basically a little dry run in a one-world government. I mean, think about it. States didn't want it. Those who fought for the revolution didn't want it. They had no idea that they were throwing out the Articles of Confederation, thought they were going to get revamped, and all of a sudden, in secret, the founding fathers, not elected, uh, threw that out and brought in the adopted constitution, but be that as it may. It's all this consolidation. is It's just better for you. It's better for the common good. And with it, we'll leave it right there. This is uh, part one of the 1934 uh, coup boo. And um, stay with us for however many parts we have. I hope it's interesting to you. I'm trying to cut out the fat without biasing what I'm doing. You all can read where I'm reading from. This book by um, Sutton, by the way, came out in 1975. That's original edition from the Arlington House Publishers. It is one that is not online as of yet. Uh, uh, thanks for being with us. This is Think or Be Eaten. The target, the supposed victim, d didn't bat an eye. So, hmm, why? Why, you know, FDR not putting his fist down and saying, whoa, what, what are you letting this guy get away for? What about the suppressed testimony that nobody's hearing about? I don't know. And I'm, I'm open to ideas, and after I get through this, and I can only tell you this. In my heart, I believe... It was a stage show to gain sympathy, support for FDR for what was clearly socialist moves. There's no two ways about it. We're seeing it today. This is a carbon copy, okay, with certain differences. Generally speaking, we are being Sovietized and socialized probably, in, when this is all over and done with, in as great a manner as what took place under FDR, which was not his idea. And I'll say why in a minute. But if it's not as big as that one, it's going to be the final. And I was, I had, I don't listen to my archives, but I did have to hit a few to find out how to title some of them. They're up there now for June. This is volume two. And I, I had a laugh because in one of them, when it was just one of the acts between Harry and myself, in November of 2002, Right around Thanksgiving, a little bit before and after, when we talked about some of these subjects, I, I said back then that there is going to be a repeat of a sort of Weimar Republic to the National Socialists here, um, with and also with the same kind of things that were happening on FDR, with WPA projects and CCCs and all this. And I was saying that back then. I mean, I, I didn't even know I was doing that. I don't know what that means, but it seemed clear to me. And the reason why I say that FDR was not the one to come up with all these uh, social programs, because in a 1932, this will be um, Think or Be Eaten, number five, um, the 1934 coup, boo. And more about that just in a minute. <clears throat> a couple things real quick. Cause in a sense, they have something to do with this topic of... Um, the 1934 coup to unseat the sitting president, FDR. But um, it is what? I think it's what, June 2nd? I believe that's the day I'm doing this. Yeah, June 2nd. What happened to the swine flu? And what happened to North Korea? <clears throat> and I bring that up because in Iran, there's a little Iran thing going on, but not much. So what do they have us worried about uh, today? I don't know. Um, but there's something, I guess, I, I missed. Um, maybe hurricanes and, you know, freaking everybody about that and how it's got to do with global warming, which it does not. And William Gray gave a, a very 
a very uh, dynamic presentation uh, a year ago that my boss's, uh, my wife's boss attended and which we um, listened to on the stream and also played some of it back. He explained it all, but you know, he said, you know, the trouble with these people, meaning Gore and those types, because they don't want to deal with science, <clears throat> right? So anyway, uh, the reason I bring that up is because newspapers, and this is uh, going to be addressed in one of the two books I'm going to use uh, to uh, break down this 1934 coup and its principles, the most colorful of which, of whom, would be Smedley Butler. But by this time already, and I, I think I read part of this as well before from the congressional record, where the newspapers were already tied up at this time. So they were at the behest of the handlers. And in this case, uh, Sutton comes down quite hard. Now, I, I would ask you if you get a chance to go read John Carlson's book, um, Undercover, which you can read online. And if, if you can either put that in a search engine and find it, because it's, it's on a Spitfire site. Forget what Dave Emery says about it. Just get past his bullshit and go on to reading it for yourself, okay? I'm glad it's up there. It's a good service. And all, it, or also, you can go to um, thinkofbeeaten.com, hit the, um, uh, the uh, link for the uh, Inside the Grassy you Knoll know, Ezine, and you um, uh, can click on my uh, recommended readings, and it's in there. But Carlson talks about this, about this pro-fascist sentiment, ah, that's the best word, in the United States. And it, uh, it may factor into what we're going to read here. And I will tell you that the two books are Wall Street and FDR by Antony, Antony C. Sutton and also Maverick Marine, which is about Butler by Hans Schmidt. And it devotes a, a certain amount of pages, uh, a considerable amount of pages to the coup and Butler's involvement. And also, so it gives you two sources. Most people, I think, are just aware of whatever's been excerpted from Jules Archer. I don't know how many people have read Archer's book, but, and other people chiming in on this, and I know Emory's got interviews up there. I don't know who they're from. I didn't want to hear them. I'm just doing what I found. I'm not devaluing what's out there, but I did what I had to do free of anybody else's in, um, influence. Because something isn't right about this. Something's very not right about this. And the reason I say it is because you had no indictments, even though some witnesses uh, perjured themselves before the uh, committee they had um, for un-American activities. But here's the other thing, too, and that is if you're trying to, let's face it, overthrow a sitting president, that's treason. I mean, that's punishable by execution. But FDR, the, the, I believe Hans Schmidt does also, uh, on the New York Times and some other papers, the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, for not, for dropping complete coverage of the uh, hearings about the coup. And so we see that today also in all media. Back then they had to deal with the newspapers, and by the 30s obviously they had radio, and you know that fell under uh, the uh, aegis of the robber barons, most notably Rockefeller and Morgan. Uh, so uh, that's what we're looking at. Also, at that time, there might have been a certain... Um, I don't want to say mm, sympathy for, perhaps interest in, the fascist movement in Europe. I guess most notably at that time would be Germany, Italy, and France, in, in that order. Uh, I don't know that Americans thought it that um, evil. Part of the fascist, pro-fascist faction in the United States at that time may have been uh, because a certain segment of the population, and I would assume a large one, uh, was pro-German. Not necessarily pro-Hitler, uh, but pro-German and anti-Brit. I think that goes back even to the founding of this country. Uh, so uh, there might have been a little bit more of an openness to uh, not necessarily embrace fascism, but see it as a necessary neutralizer or antidote to communism. But to me, it's still both sides of the same coin. It's another Hegelian dialectic. And that brings me to this also. Um, given 1934 and the coup, and a certain element that was pro-German, 
and it's by extension a certain percentage of that, and it may have been large, I don't know, was anti-Jewish. And they also equated uh, Jews with communism. A book by William Z. Foster, who was second in command of the American Communist Party, wrote at that time in Toward Soviet America, also readable online, and that's in my recommended reading. If you want to go there, that's easiest for you to hit. And he said, you know, this is what's going to happen in the United States. He knew, in, well, obviously before 32, and this is before 34, 33, 34 is when uh, the heavy programs started to get uh, implemented, the social programs, that this was going to happen. So how did Foster know? And he was the second in command soon to replace Earl uh, Browder, who they kicked to the curb. And you can read about that in... Um, Bella Dodds, School of Darkness, also there to be read online. There's a lot of good stuff out there, and again, I have that link somewhere. I checked those links before we went up with the uh, Inside the Grassy Knoll, and they were all good. And they do sometimes disappear, sometimes they go somewhere else. But boy, I'll tell you. So anyway, not to go too far afield, the American communists knew this was going to happen. And who else, who, who knows who else didn't know? You know, probably John Dewey knew. And a lot of pro-communist, pro-leftist type people that this was going to happen. They knew that this wasn't FDR's idea. This is the plan he got. And the robber barons were behind that. That's why in the 50s you had the two committees with, with whatever patriotic Americans were left in Congress to take a look at what was going on with the tax-exempt foundations. The Cox and the Reese committees both were trashed. Uh, Wayne Hayes, that idiot who got caught with a bimbo in the Washington, was it the Jefferson Basin or whatever? idiot. Well, he got what he deserved. But anyway, uh, he was placed on at least one of those committees. He might have been on both, but uh, to make sure that he uh, could obstruct them as best he could, and he did. Now, you know, if you go to Wikipedia and read about the Cox or the Reese committees, they're like, well, you know, nothing was ever brought up. Look, Wikipedia is as bought out and as controlled as your other encyclopedias and history texts. I go to Wikipedia to find dates, and that's about it. 